Hebrews chapter 4 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in, was in all points tempted as we are, and yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. Father, we come this morning boldly. We know we don't deserve what we receive. We've deserved an awful lot that we have not received. Your grace we ask for, for today, for right now, in this place. And Father, we thank you for your mercies that were new this morning, for everything in our past. May we, in fact, find ourselves at the foot of the cross, worshiping you today and discovering what it is we need to be free, absolutely free in Jesus. Lord, I ask that you would be merciful to me in the regard of being your mouth this morning. Lord, speak what you want. Deliver your word to us. All for the sake and name and glory of Jesus. Amen. 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 Something someone shared with me about this verse, and if you've not heard it, I'll share it with you, and you can pass it along. That grace is for today forward, right? I need grace for today forward, but his mercy is from everything here backwards. Have you heard that? This is new to you or new to me? It's new to me. I, you know, I've only been at this for a couple of years. And I need his grace today. Amen? I also need a couple of ushers, which is no, I need you to hand these out for me. Could you do that? Or you gentlemen that were maybe receiving the offering, can we give something back? Yeah, thank you, Russ. Ellen. I'm going to be working from this page today, and it's basically the uh, scriptures that we're going to be reviewing together in the New Living Translation. You know, we have so many translations these days that when you say, let's open to a passage, they read a little different. I noticed that even as we were reading Psalm 51 together, I finally closed my Bible, which was a different version, and listened to what was being said. It's really good to see you guys. It's good to see you. You know, I told Pastor Bill, I said, I, I can't keep coming back. I'm starting to connect to the hearts of the people. And we're pastors. It's in us. We begin to know you. And so next time I see you, I say, well, how's it going with that thing we talked about last time? And, uh, but it's good to be a pastor. Amen? You all want to be pastors? I see, I see no hands. Let's go on record. I see no hands. I'm just kidding. One hand. We'll keep him as pastor. What do you say? I was given this difficult topic to deal with. And it is difficult, but it's not impossible. What's impossible, I will attempt with his help today, and that is to answer the question in about half an hour. That's sure. impossible. <laughs> sure. Good, good. Why is he slow in giving me the strength to resist sin? And I've put this into three pieces today. The first part is called struggling with sin. And our scripture reference, Romans 7, starting at verse 14, in one way is kind of unfortunate is because if you're, if you're like me and you begin reading where we will in just a moment, 714 Romans, as if you've read the Bible or you've read the book of Romans specifically, as you begin to read, your mind and your spirit man says, oh, we need to go back a little further and start again. And we might go back to the beginning of chapter 7. And if we start reading there and say, oh, I just need to go back into 6. And so you start reading the Bible backwards. <laughs> 
And that's, this is, I just want to make that clear to us this morning that we're picking up in the middle of an immense communication from, past, from the Apostle Paul, and we're trying to start somewhere in the middle. And so I'll try to pull some things from seven and six as we go, because it's important. There are foundations that he has already written in his communique to speak to the issue. But in answering this question, why is God so slow? In giving me the strength to resist sin, watch out, the answer is in the first verse. Verse 14, so the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me. There's the answer. See, I answered in less than 30 minutes. The trouble. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. Go right, right. <laughs> Right to communion, here we go. <laughs> the trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself for what I want to do, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. He's referring back further now to seven, six, in that he's asked the question, is the law, is, is, is it good or is it evil? Has it become sin to me or is it, what's the problem with the law? And the truth of the law is simply this. The law was given to us in Galatians, Paul writes this, that it was given to us as a schoolmaster. It was given to us as a teacher. And its only task was to constantly show us that we fail. Its task and its job was to point at us and say, thou shalt not, and then immediately we did. And so we proved that the law is spiritual and good. It's accurate. It's holy. And we're not. That's what it's for. It's to constantly remind you of what Isaiah said, all my righteousness is like filthy rags. Now, I'm trying to tear you down, if you haven't noticed. In other words, what I'm wanting you to understand in this first part is that on your very best day, I mean, you have, have you had a good day lately? You know, you didn't say anything wrong. You didn't, you didn't get upset when they pulled out in front of you. They, uh, you didn't yell at your husband or your wife or your kids. and You got to the end of the day and said, you know, today was a pretty good day. I, I don't even remember if I, I don't think I sinned anywhere today. <laughs> I, I don't, I, I feel pretty good about this. And I turn to God and say, God, I want to present you with this, my best day. This is my best day ever. And he goes, ooh, filthy rags. The best you have. I'm not trying to cut you down in, in the sense of being irreverent towards you. I'm just being honest that the Bible says on your very best day, it's no good. And the law was written to help us understand that. Let's see if we can, I mean, we know the big 10, right? Oh, I'm sorry, you probably call it 10 commandments. Let's just, thou shall not bear false witness. Thou shall not lie. Okay, everybody that has not lied, please stand so that we can affirm that you just did. <laughs> Verse 17, so I'm not the one doing wrong. It's sin that's living in me that does it. This is a challenging passage. I know that nothing good lives in me. That is, in my sinful nature. And it's important for us to point out that this word in the original text is sarx. We would say S-A-R-X. Sarx, the carnal nature. The nature that fell from his presence and began to do nothing but evil. Its bent is towards evil. It's the sinful nature that was passed to us from Adam. And we all have it. It's called the sarx. It's carnal nature. Sometimes the, the Bible says, in my body dwells no good thing. But that's not true. That's a different Greek word that says soma. God is very interested in your soma. He's interested in your body. 
We're supposed to take care of it. Supposed to, he's, he loves to heal us. He loves to make us whole. He's going to give us a new one someday. He's interested in our body because that's where we live, right? We're spiritual beings having kind of a natural experience in that regard. So he's interested in your body, but he's not in cooperation with the sarks. So I'm not the one doing wrong. Sin living, living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sarks, my sinful nature. I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It's sin living in me that does it. It's the sinful nature. It was a principle, I've heard of this, that if, there, if you were a murderer and you were caught, they would get the corpse and tie it to your body. And you had to walk around and carry the corpse. It was part of the punishment before they uh, judged you and condemned you for your crime. And in a sense, this is what we feel when we ask this question, I'm struggling with sin, and why doesn't God, why does he come sooner and help me? And I've got this corpse attached to me. I'm carrying the old me around on my back. I've got this sarks nature that when I want to do good, I, I just don't do it. And I say no, and then next time you know I'm doing it again. And some of us, we like to refer to this or, or commonly as a compulsive behavior or a continuing repetitive same issue that I fight all the time and I never win. Let me tell you the really good news. You never will win. Oh, wait, that wasn't the good news, was it? That was the bad news. You won't win. I've discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what's wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power or another law within me that's at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that's still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Anybody want to say amen? amen. This, is our, this is our grief. This is the moment of our, we're being attacked by the law, by the word of God that tells us we're miserable. What a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Mine's bold and underlined. Yours probably isn't, sorry. But I wanted to remind us that it says, thank God, the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I mean, have you ever went to a Sunday school class? Anyway, seriously, and that's not a trick question. I'm not going to hoodwink you. I've been to a Sunday school class. Remember when you were little? This is, you, maybe you've heard this. The class was going on, and the teacher says, okay, I'm going to begin to describe something to you, children. And as soon as you think you know what it is, just raise your hand and tell me the answer. Okay? Okay. So it's small, gray, two little ears, big, long, bushy tail, and boy, you four feet. Oh, well, Johnny's got his hand up. Yes, Johnny. He says, teacher, I know the answer is Jesus. <laughs> but it, it sure sounds like a squirrel. <laughs> right? Isn't that what we're always told? Jesus is always the answer. No matter what, Jesus is the answer. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's not a squirrel. So you see how it is in my mind, I really want to obey God's law. Is that true of you? In your mind, you really do want to please God. I mean, you wake up in the morning, you think, today I'm going to please Jesus. You don't get out of bed thinking otherwise. After we've come to know him, he saved us, he removed our sin. We don't get up in the morning trying to figure out how to be wrong. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. There's a beautiful illustration at the beginning of this chapter, in Romans 7, that's just an illustration, but we take it too far. But he says, the law says as long as a woman is married to a man, she's his for life, right? 
No divorce, no separation. Can't, you know, it's very clear. It says, however, if the man dies, the woman is freed. She can actually marry again. She can live alone. But she's free from her first husband if he's dead. And then Paul says, that's you and the law. You're married to the law. And it constantly tells you you're failing, you're doing bad, you're wrong. You're, you cannot please God in your flesh. You cannot make God happy. You can't do it any better. You've tried and you keep failing. And it constantly convicts you and condemns you. But then Paul says, but Jesus came. And when he went to the cross, he took the law with him. He fulfilled it and he removed it. And he said, now here's grace. Here's the ability to please me. It's not going to be by your ability, but my ability living in you. You can't do it by the law. And yet we struggle with the sinful nature. We, we read passages like Romans chapter 6, verse 12, where it sounds like this command, okay? Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. That's a pretty strong word. And the, the onus is on you. Don't you let it happen. And then about halfway through the day, we let it happen. And we think, how am I ever going to get this right? The next verse says, and don't present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God, for sin shall not have dominion over you. It's good so far. The last part of the verse says, for you are not under law, but under grace. These commands, we read them and say, I have to obey them. Wait, wait, commands. Maybe you could equate that with commandments. Maybe you could see that as the law-driven side that we've been set free from, where there's constantly this list of things I gotta do, and I can't do them. We need to come to the point where we say, hmm, I can't. I can't. Now, it's, a, it's a place of failure. It's a difficult thing for us to do. Say, God, I can't. Thou shalt not. I can't. I'm going to do that. Thou shalt. I can't do that either. I want to do it, but then it doesn't work out. What? God, what is going on and how is this going to be? Here's the problem. It just feels like this whole thing is backwards and sin is winning. And you're not helping me in time. Ooh. <laughs> I don't know how you feel when I say that, but I feel like I just stepped out on some pretty thin ice. You know, he's eternal. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. And he's late? Probably not. Let's go back to that first verse where it says, the, the problem's with me. But the problem is it's with me and I can't do any better. Kind of a trap. In verse 16 of chapter 6, Romans says, Don't you know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slave? Whether sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. Oh, well, I do have some choices, don't I? I can make a decision at some moments of whether I'm going to yield, whether I'm going to give over. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ. The struggling with sin is a constancy. I, I think I put in my notes it's a lifelong wrestling match. How can we begin to win it? We, we continue to read. We don't just take seven Romans and lift it up and say, now there's a quandary. How am I going to deal with that? We need to keep reading what Paul wrote in chapter 8. And the second part of today is that we need to know what it is to have life in the Spirit. I need this. Life in the Spirit. Chapter 8. So now there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. I'm going to ruin this for some of you today. We look at that and we like to console ourselves on a regular and daily basis. Oh, there's no condemnation. 
No condemnation. I can do this and there's no condemnation. That is not what this verse says. This verse says there's no eternal damnation or I, I am released from his judgment eternally. I'm not ever going to come under the judgment that leads to total condemnation and alienation from God in eternity. There's no condemnation. There's no judgment to failure completely that will come from God against me once I'm in Christ. But let's not just use it as sort of a salve on a daily basis for our wrongdoing. I can do this and not be condemned about it. I'm just saying, be careful. There's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus, and because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you. This verse says the power, but also means the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. There's that Sark's thing again. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us. I don't know how many times we've read this. I don't know if you've ever read this. But the Bible is true. Right? Jesus was the living truth. And if the Bible says, God declared an end to sin's control over us, I want to find out how does that work? Because it's true. It's available. He did it by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that ju the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Are you trying to follow the Spirit? Just, you know, it's a simple question. I wish we were kind of all in a living room and had coffee or tea or whatever. And we were just chatting about this. I would say, hey, how are you doing? Are you just really trying to follow a Spirit? I think the answer most often is, yeah, I'm really working at it. I am. It's what I love. I want to follow Him. We're no longer following our sinful nature, our sarks. We don't get up to, to please the flesh, but we end up doing it. Verse five, those who are dominated, here's the issue, are dominated by the sinful nature, think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about the things that please the Spirit. Our thought life is involved. That's why Paul writes later, Romans chapter 12, that we need to be renewed in our mind by the word of God. We need to hear the word of God over and over and over. We need to read the word of God. We need to have it take up residency in our mind. But even more importantly, we need to be led by his spirit. We're triune beings built in the image of God. We are spirit, soul, body. I think I've talked about that before when I was here. And that we, oftentimes even, if you say, hey, are you a triune being? Say, yeah, what are you? People will say, well, body, soul, spirit. We just say it backwards. It's subtle. But our mind says, I'm body first, soul second, spirit last, because that came into my life last. I was born again after I had a body and a soul. And so I tend to put the spirit in the, in the final regard. We need to put him in the front seat. Say, Holy Spirit, you're leading. And my mind needs to come into agreement with the spirit. That happens by the renewing of my mind, Romans 12, 2, by the hearing of the word of God and coming into agreement with that. Then my soma, my body, can be used in a pleasing way to honor God. And my sarks, my carnal nature, is no longer the dominant factor. It doesn't lead my day. It doesn't tell me what to do anymore. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Verse seven, for the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. And I can almost hear you asking the question, really? <laughs> Am I alone? 
You read that and say, well, maybe that belongs to somebody else. No, it belongs to you. You are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you've been made right with God. Man, there's a lot in here. It's a big passage. I've been made right with God. You've been made right with God. My, my, my brother Mike here from Soldiers, we, when we go out, we know we've been made right with God, but our mission is to help others understand how they can be made right with God because they're not right with God, right? When we're in the street, we're on the corner, we're at our work, we're at our school, wherever we go, wherever God has you put, when you get there, you can stand in front of anybody and say, I've been made right with God. I'm kind of a thinker and goofy one. You can only imagine what goes on in here. <laughs> A friend of mine says, don't go in there without a flashlight. <laughs> you may never get out, you know. But I've tried to imagine a person of great esteem, you know, a, a powerful person that you might think of somebody different. I, I don't know, Colin Powell or a, a past president. And being ushered into the same room where they are. And, and I said, well, how would I feel being introduced to someone of that stature or that esteem? And I'm really comfortable. <laughs> I would be able to say, hey, how you doing? Because I know I can stand in front of the Heavenly Father without any fear at all. Amen. I'm not going to fear man. I mean, I'm going to honor their position, of course. And, you know, you, you want to have honor where honor is due. You're going to be right-hearted in the situation. But there's no, it's a level playing field when you're right with God. Amen. When, when you know you can just walk in and say, Father, um, it's good to be here in your presence again. And I'm glad I'm acceptable in your presence because your word says you've made me acceptable in the beloved. I, I, I don't deserve to be here. That I know. I don't deserve it. But you said I could. And then you said, please do. You know, his love is so powerful that it goes right past your failures. See, we come weeping, and this is the Psalm 51, you know, broken heart, contrite spirit when we come, and we know we've, we've failed, we've offended him. We're like David, and even though David, you know, killed somebody and lied about stuff and committed adultery. He says to God, I've, I've sinned against you and you alone. I, I wrestled with that. I said, wait a minute, who, you left a trail of people. How could you say that? Because ultimately it's true. In all of what I've done, I've committed sin and I've sinned against you, Father. And so we kind of have our head down. And he wants to say, listen, I've been there. We were tempted. We were tried. We sang it this morning. Just like, just like you were, but without sin, so that we could give you this gift of grace. Now just pick your head up and come on in because I want to spend time with you. I love you so much. I don't want this to separate us in any way. Whatever it is, just drop it. Let's move on. Tell me about it, sure. I'll, I'll issue another forgiveness decree on that one thing, but I can't let it stop you from coming. I need you. I love you. Galatians 5.16 says that if we walk in the spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We have a choice. How do I want to yield? How do I want to think? What do I want to let dominate my thinking? Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the spirit gives you life because you've been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. My goodness. God? 
indwells you. I'm just taking a moment. I mean, it's a big thought. <laughs> um, I, I love looking into our faces. I have the advantage. I'm on this side. I get all of you. But I look and I think, God lives in there. Doesn't matter which face I pick, if you've called on Jesus, he's in there. And he's come, he wants out. He wants to shine through. And if I spend enough time with you and you with me, we're going to find out all our problems and all the reasons why we might not like each other and hang out. But the longer we stay together, we'll discover the Jesus inside of each one that says this is our commonality. This is what makes us one. This is what creates a body and a congregation and a community of people out of very dissimilar people. In any other context, a lot of us wouldn't even want to be in the same room with each other. We wouldn't choose each other as friends. But when we come to the cross and levels the playing field, and then I can look and say, Jesus is living in there. <laughs> I'm going to find him. I'm going to find him. In you, I'm going to find him. And oh, what a delight when I do. Remember last week I said we can't do this alone. Living in community is one of the strongest, most biblical methods for advancing your spiritual maturity in Christ. You know, just getting down with others, rubbing elbows, especially if you pray together. Oh my goodness, prayer produces such intimacy between people. When you pray and open your heart before God and other people are with you, it's amazing what that builds in commonality and in unity. Cut them up, slam them together, and it says community. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, and just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. You know Galatians 2.20, perhaps. I've been crucified with Christ. Listen, when you were crucified with Christ, now you have to read Romans chapter 6. I mean, this is your homework. Read Romans chapter 6. What? Don't you know that when you were baptized, how many of you have been baptized? We, got, we could fill this up and take care of some of you this afternoon if you want. But if you, the Bible, Paul says, if you've been baptized... You're dead. That's why we did it. You're dead. You're identifying that you were with Christ in death. That him on the cross was actually you on the cross. You were there. We can emotionally approach that and say, well, yeah, I know. I put him there. It was my sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. And we can go through all that and just get heady about it. But the truth of it is, if I look at the cross, I say the reason Jesus was there is because of my sin, your sin. He didn't have to go there. He chose to go there. And when he went there, he took me with him. So I'm dead, as dead as he was dead, and he is raised from the dead. And when I came out of the waters of baptism, I am saying I'm alive forevermore, and I am no longer the same. Amen. I'm alive in Christ. His life is in me. Paul says I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not me living, but it's Christ living in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. He loved me. He loved me. He is not out to defeat me. He is not saying, you failed again. What is wrong with you? It's, not his, it's just not his motive. If he wanted to condemn us and kill us, he could do it. If he had wanted to do that, he would have never sent his son Jesus in a point of love to say, I'm going to make a way back for you. He would have just left us in our sinfulness and said, you're on your own. But that's not his heart. Right? His motive is love. His passion is you. And I just look into each one of your faces and I sense God wants to tell you he loves you. His passion is toward you. If he could just get you alone for a little while every day, he would pour his love out into you like you could never believe. And he would affirm you and say, yeah, you're rotten to the core. You were worthless. 
your righteousness is filthy rags. But I reached through all of it with the cross and I got you for myself. And now I want you all the time. Come on, walk with me. Sit on my lap, talk to me. Tell me what you're feeling. Go ahead, spill it out. Let me work with you. I'm gonna form Christ-likeness in you because he's already living in there. Let's let him out. Pardon me, I just feel a little passionate about some of this. And I should bring my own Kleenex. I'll learn that part. Jesus lives in me. His spirit is within you. How can we lose? Really? How can we lose? See, but we let this struggle with sin make us think we're losing. How do you win this match? How do you win this struggling? Let's go on to verse 12. <laughs> Thank you. And that right now you're saying, I sure hope. I'm going to keep an eye on that, Pastor Jeff, because if he handles the communion right before he gives it to me, <laughs> no deal. All, it's off. Jesus, I'll see you next month. <laughs> and I know you understand. Do you know why your nose runs when you cry? If, there's too much fluid up here and it jumps into the little ducts in the bottom of your eyelids and it dumps into your nose. And when it's too full to do that, it spills over and runs down your cheeks. You know, you can learn something when you go to church. <laughs> so you get too many tears, it's got to go somewhere. Nose first, cheek second. Ask your optometrist. Verse 12, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. You're not obligated. See, you used to be obligated. You used to have to do it. Your body and your soul in its fallen state, in that fallen Sark's nature, was in control. And you had to do it. You didn't get a choice. It's just how you lived but you didn't care because you were dead spiritually. Now you're alive from the dead. Now you have Jesus living in you and he cares. And you have no longer any obligation. You don't have to. Next time that urge comes, next time that thing pops up or that person invites you to do it again, you say, you know what, I don't have any obligation here. I'm not indebted to that. I do not have to do that. Take a stand. But even in your strongest moment, you will fail. I'm not guaranteeing it. I'm just saying the Bible tells us we're going to fall short. And you've all heard that, you know. God help us with our falling shorts. <laughs> you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do, for if you live by its dictates, you will die. And we don't have to talk very long to say, remember the last time when you decided to live by the dictates of the flesh and immediately the enemy was there to tell you how you were a failure. Immediately you felt the depressed state of your whole system saying, I failed. You felt the whole anguish of your spirit man saying, I don't have fellowship with God right now because of this. I mean, it produces death and separation. And God doesn't want that. He loves you. He wants you with him. So it says, but if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Now, I'm going to give you another passage. You, you can jot it down if you want. Colossians 3, 5. And this is how I want to come to a conclusion here. And I mean that. <laughs> Just like the little boy sitting in church next to his mom and dad. He's watching everything happen. And, you know, the worship team does its thing. You see? Hey, what does that mean? Well, that means it's time for us to sing, so we're going to get ready to do that. Okay, okay. The ushers come. Is that me rustling around here? Sorry. Get rid of the rustle. Took care of that. <laughs> so the ushers stand up and put the plates. Mom, what does that mean? Well, they're going to receive an offering now, and we're going to put, oh, okay. Well, later on, pastor's preaching away, and he goes like this. 
Mom, what does that mean? She goes, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it's not true here. Just had a moment to have a little humor. For all who are led by the Spirit of God or children of God, you can through the power of your spirit, of the Spirit, put to death the deeds of your sinful nature. Colossians 3, 5 says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Now in the King James Version, back when I started studying the Bible, the words were the same. They said, both said mortify. My responsibility to mortify the deeds of the flesh. I thought, what is mortify? That is like Shakespearean to the bone. So I looked it up, and here's what it means. You are to derive, or, or to deprive, excuse me, deprive of power, destroy the strength of, and wrestle to the ground your members which are contrary to God, whatever it is. Your job, Paul says, wrestle it to the ground and hold it there. Have you got the picture? Winning the match, we're talking about wrestling against this issue of struggling with sin and life in the spirit and the constancy that we're going to go through for the rest of our time on the planet. How do I win the match? Paul says, wrestle that stuff to the ground. Take those thoughts captive. You know these passages. Bring every thought captive to Christ, right? We're, there's, an, there's an active part of us that says, get a hold of that thing and deprive it of power. Steal its life out. Put it on the ground and hold it there. But how, the question becomes, how long can I last? In my own strength, how well do I do? Wrestling that thing to the ground and holding it there. Some of the behaviors and sins in my life feel like if I don't sit on top of them always, they will get up, right? Just like in, just like in the ring. I'm holding this thing to the ground and it's, it's struggling against me. As soon as I let up, it's back up, and it's after me. But in Romans chapter 8, Paul takes the same word mortify and uses a different Greek word, which we can miss in the English. And he says, if through the power of who? If through the power of the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that lives in you, if by that power, you can put to death the deeds of the sinful nature. Here's the picture. I do all I can to wrestle it to the ground and hold it there. And then as soon as I get a grip on it and it's struggling against me, I go, Jesus, help me. <laughs> by the power of the spirit that's in me, by your strength, demolish this thing. And the power of God comes and crushes it to nothingness. If you've ever been set free of something, you know this is true. I tell the story of when I used to smoke. It's easy to quit. Did it five times. <laughs> you know how that works. And uh, somebody said, you never smoked. The cigarette smoked. You were the sucker. <laughs> it's just something to pick on. It could be anything. But there came that point when I said, God, I can't but I think you can. And that's what I want us to hear this morning. I can't, but he can. I said, I, I just pray that you will deliver me, just take away whatever it is in my body that's connected to nicotine or the need or the dependency, just remove it. And if I ever smoke again, make me sick. I woke up the next morning, I had no desire. And I was amazed by it. I thought, wow, this feels different. And said, so, well, just move on. I prayed. And I never smoked again. That was after quitting the fifth time, when I knew I couldn't do it myself. A year later, seriously, no, no desire, nothing. It was gone. Was, yes. Look at all the money I'm saving. <laughs> A year later, I'm, as an old smoker, if you were one or still are one, you'll relate, Maybe. You know, I was a young guy. I was a kid. Didn't have a lot of money. So I'm passing an ashtray, and there's a big, long butt. Somebody left there. I thought, hey, I wonder what it would be like. I'm sure that thought was not mine. 
fiery dart, you know. Hey. So I grabbed that thing and lit it up, and I was heaving. I had never been sick from smoking before, ever, even as a kid. And I'm green, and I'm puking. And it's like in the middle of that moment, a little tap on the shoulder almost, and he says, I didn't forget the second prayer. (laughs) I forgot. I forgot. He did not forget. He said, I answered both prayers. Now, is he intimate or not? He's keeping track, and he loves me enough to say, here's the answer to your other prayer. Wrestle those things to the ground, do the best you can to deny it, say no, renew your mind, fight against it. But ultimately, the only way you'll win is by life in the Spirit, by letting Jesus live his life through you, understanding that you are crucified with Christ. You were buried, dead. No more you. When you came up out of the water and you're alive in Christ, it's brand new, it's all over. You get to be now him living in you. He can say no to things. He can destroy things. He can deliver you overnight. He can deliver you in an instant of issues. Sometimes it doesn't come that way. But if you can walk free of it, he'll help you walk free of it by his strength and not yours. Romans 8 Chapter chapter 8, 35 through 37 says, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Through him, not through me, through him who loves us. He doesn't hate us. He loves us. He wants us to make it. He's ready to live his life in us so that we can make it. But the more we depend on ourselves, the worse it gets. One final story. Any boxing fans? Boxing fans? I'll I'll get the names wrong if I try and name boxers, so I won't, just so you know. But step into the ring, you know? And these guys are evenly matched, and they're pummeling each other. And it goes, how many rounds till the whole thing's over? 10, 15, whatever it is. 12? It's tiring. You know, they're just swollen up. And finally, at the end, boom, boom, boom. It's called, they go to the judges, they bring the guy out to the middle and they pull his hand into the air and they throw the belt over his shoulder and they say, the winner and new champion. The place is going wild. People are pouring into the ring. Unnoticed, this frail, small, beautiful little girl, woman, makes her way through the ropes, walks over to him, takes the envelope that he just was handed, which contains the check for the millions of dollars for winning, takes the envelope and slips out of the ring. It's his wife. Okay, you got the picture? It's his wife, right? Now, conqueror, fought it out every round, beat, pulp, ugly, swollen, bleeding, broken. More than a conqueror. (laughs) Didn't have to train, didn't have to eat, didn't have to deny herself anything, didn't have to get up early and run, didn't have to do any of that. And she's got the envelope. (laughs) Conqueror. More than a conqueror. (laughs) What am I telling you? Jesus went into the ring for you. you, Jesus Jesus Christ, the Son of God, went into the ring for you. In a body like the one you fight with every day. And he fought it out with his arch enemy to the very end and it killed him. He spent his life and his blood. We sing about it, we think about it, we talk about it. 
And we're going to celebrate communion next. And we're thinking about his blood and his body poured out, broken for us. Conqueror. Jesus the conqueror. And then he turns to you and I and says, you get to be more than a conqueror. You don't have to go that fight. You don't have to take on that war. I took it on for you. I hand you the victory. I give it to you freely. Why? Because he loves you. And why does he love you? Because he chose to. He loves you because he wants to. And he wants to every day.